help me if I'm not being nice. Okay, so we are back here. Let's see. So we got, oh, those are the types. Um, there are, what did I say here? So we're at uh, types of bearings, a plane, plane. So we're still talking about plane. And what, oh, a material. And then, there we go, three. And then other types. I have types here again because we can define it in further types. We have tang bearings. Tang, you guys probably don't remember tang. It's the astronaut's drink. Um, <laughs> has a tang, tang, and dowel. D, oops, let's try dowel with a D, not a B. Dowel, D-O-W-L, a dowel um, to hold in place. To hold, I'm gonna go up here, to hold in place. All right, and that, Types, rabbit surfaces, three types. A tang has a oh, tang uh, and dowel to hold in place. Babbitt surface. Were we back before the break? Yeah. Babbitt surface. Bronze, Bronze backed with lead yeah. or babbitt surface. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's a, a dowel? I'm going to show you. So thank you for asking. That was a good question. I just got to find what I want. They're all out of order. I guess I just go back and forth between different things. No, I went the wrong way. Go back, go back. Too far. I got to go around the horn. What movie's that from? Okay, what is that Amazon thing you're trying to purchase? I'll show you. you okay, these are the dowels. So really, it's just a steel uh, piece of steel, round piece of steel. So a dowel, there's wood dowels. Um, a wood dowel is just a, well, this... This pencil would be a wood dowel if it didn't have graphite in the middle. It's, it, it's a round round piece, they call it a dowel. So you can take metal dowels, wood dowels, it's a round piece of something. And But what it is, this has a tang right here. It might be a little hard to see, but you had tangs on yours, okay? Um, but you didn't have dowels. This one has a tang and a dowel. And those dowels keep the bearing from spinning. You just have tangs that keep the bearing from spinning. So this particular engine is higher horsepower, so it has a tang and a dowel. Are those dowels have holes in the uh, They do, and that's so that you can actually pull them out. Oh, okay. yeah. There we go. Um, and they also have, let's see, high crush. High crush. Um, high crush type. And your manual will talk about high crush bearings. And again, it's just one of those things, high crush, like, High crush, um, high crush bearing. There, put this. They have a tang, has a tang, but sticks up, sticks up about 0 .003, so that's three thousandths of an inch above the parting flange. Above the parting flange. And is crushed into place, and is crushed, crushed into place. So that's what you got with your plane bearings. So those are plane. Then we have anti-friction type. That's also a type of bearing. Yep, but it's not. A, so there's plane bearing, and they have the whole group of plane bearings. Then outside of plane bearings, we have anti-friction type, which is not a plane bearing. It's a whole other type. And what are my anti-friction types? Well, we have roller and ball. So we'll talk about roller first. We'll take a look at a picture of a roller bearing here. And sometimes it's difficult to, there we go. Remember this, these are our anti-friction type. So this is a, it's always easier to start with this one. This is a ball type because it has balls. balls. This is a roller type because it has rollers. So if I, if I just kind of said, well, a roller type, you might think this type. Well, it rolls, doesn't it? But the distinction is ball versus roller. So ball type, roller type. Okay, so we have a straight roller, a straight ball, and this is a tapered roller because it's actually tapered. It's not straight. The inside is straight, and the, so the inside would go on like an axle, and then 
this goes, um, well, it's, you have a cup and a cone, or the bearing and the race, but they call them cups and cones, which is confusing. She's like, well, which one's the cup and which one's the cone? So I just say, you got the bearing and you got the race. And so this race goes on top of that, and the race is also tapered. So when you put the two together, they're very inside and outside are straight, but inside they're tapered. Yeah. Uh, like the, the wall bearing and then the roller bearing, do you ever, like, are there certain situations where you use one instead of the other? Yes, and I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> Take, for example, a radial engine around the crankshaft where you have a radial load. Which one do you think you'd want? Let's try it again. Outside in the nose section, you're going to have a thrust bearing. Which one of these would be best for thrust? Don't say taper. <laughs> Which one would be best for thrust load? Ball bearing, a deep groove ball bearing. In fact, if you look at the cutaway of this, you can see that right here it's radius down, and you can take the thrust going that way with it. Did I point the right way? Yeah, this way, because it's backwards on my screen. That way. Um, but you wouldn't do very well with the thrust on this on the roller. So out in the nose section, you're going to find a deep groove ball bearing. I think it's a Q and A question. And around the crankshaft, more where it's just a radial, then you're going to see the roller bearings. Now it's it is possible that, you, and I know a lot of engines do just have ball, 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 but it has a deep groove ball on the outside and balls in the middle. But um, there are people that make STCs. Um, Modifications so you can run the roller because the roller are much better in that radial load. Are, the, do they also, are those what they call needle bearings? When they say needle bearings? No, no. Uh, the needle bearings actually look like just very small uh, roller bearings. Yeah. They, they really are. They're just small. But the, the, the rollers are so small they call them needles. They are tiny. They're like uh, if you ever take a watch apart, the little pins that hold your, they, they look just oh, like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, roller. So we've got uh, the roller type. What do we have? We have the, they're straight. So we're talking about the roller, not the ball. We have the straight type um, that is uh, used only, used only for radial loads. And they also come in tapered. I've never seen a tapered inside of an engine, but since we're on the subject we'll just bring it up and we'll say it is radial or thrust loads and it uses an inner and outer race it uses well they all do actually so I'm just gonna make that C so uses an inner and outer race. Katie, where do you find tapered roller bearings? She's the tapered roller bearing queen. Landing gear. Landing gear. <laughs> Wheel, bearings. wheel bearings. Have I mentioned I don't like regreasing and cleaning wheel bearings? <laughs> Have I mentioned who does them now? <laughs> huh? It's easy money. Yeah, but no one's paying Katie. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I gotta do it for free. Have Katie do it. All right, now we have the ball. Ball type. Uh, least amount of friction. Why do you, why do you suppose that is? Least amount of contact area. A lot less contact area. Um, least amount of friction. Um, used for thrust or radial. Used for thrust or radial loads. Um, uses an inner and outer race <coughs> plus plus a ball retainer. So if I go back to here, you can see the ball retainers here or this uh, gold part is the ball retainer. So this one has plastic ones plus the ball retainer. Um, the thrust type, thrust, thrust type uses a deeper groove. Yeah, 
And I also put in here, see, may have, may have a thrust side. with um, a deep groove. So like I showed you in the picture, you may have a thrust side and a not thrust side. All right, where are we gonna find these things? Um, I'll make this E. Um, mostly used, I wanna do that? No, I'm gonna go back one. So where are these bearings types? We have the ball and the roller where are these types of bearings used? And so anti-friction bearings are mostly used, mostly used in radial engines or very high, very high horsepower engines. I'll abbreviate that, HP horsepower engines. So if you have a uh, an opposed engine that is really high in horsepower. Uh, you some of the older ones, they love to use, uh, especially a ball bearing up in the front. And those are uh, anti-friction bearings. Anti-friction bearings, yep. So on an opposed engine, how does that work with a ball bearing? Um, you would see it on, like when you walk into our lab, you walk in the door, not our lab, but you walk in the hangar, and you make the right, you're gonna go in, there's an engine on a yellow stand right there, with a big prop on it. Mm -hmm. That one has uh, a roller bearing up front for a thrust. But I think all the rest are plain. Oh. Otherwise, you can't fit them down the crankshaft. Well, that was, that was <laughs> yeah. So it'd be just the front front thrust. When you say five horsepower, what is like high horsepower? More than three, four hundred? Um, yeah, it's around four four hundred, four fifty. I think is the distinguishing thing. Uh, because I think it's over four fifty is when you see the spline shafts, four fifty and upper spline shafts. So you got a spline shaft too. All right, um, and they're also small, small bearings of this type, um, commonly used in accessories, small bearings uh, used commonly in accessories. All right, all my second semester people. You did both generators and magnetos and alternators. What kind of bearings do they have? Ball bearings. Ball bearings. So they all had little ball bearings. Uh, but on the generators, it had a ball up front and a bushing in the rear. Yeah. Did have a bushing back there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 The 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 yeah. Yeah, but they're sealed. So you can't even see them. Um, all right. I'm on point number eight, hopefully. Let's talk about crankshafts. Mm -hmm. uh, before I move on to crankshafts, what else can we say about bearings that are good to know? Back here, go back. You don't reuse them. It's just not worth the money. It's not worth the risk, especially inside of an engine. You just throw them out, buy new ones. All right, wheel bearings, that's different. So you got to clean them and grease them, and you're supposed to... <laughs> so you're always supposed to clean them. You blow them dry. You never spin them on your fingers because they can actually explode on you. It's very tempting. I know all mechanics have to do it because you, you get to spin it up. Yes, I know. I'm not saying I've ever done it, but they can explode in a grand fashion, and they usually do it on your fingers and seize up and rip your fingers. Uh, but you're supposed to clean them with solvent, blow them dry, and you inspect the inner race, which is very hard to see, and all of the rollers. And this race here, and you're supposed to use a 10 power magnifying glass and a light. And I remember the first time I was, of course, when you, that is usually your first job in general aviation, is you're the wheel bearing greaser. And because it, it stinks because you're down on the floor and there's always a black widow, right? There's always a black widow. Oh, yeah. Always. I don't know. They come with a black widow. And. Um, <laughs> And so you have to kill the Black Widow and get him up. Huh? Keeps the bugs out. I was at work today and I was underneath the plane and there was a fat, fat spider just like comes crawling across. And I'm just like looking up. I'm all like, oh my God, please don't bite me. <laughs> you should have killed it. Um, anyway, so you spent, but I remember my first job, I was doing that and I was being the good mechanic that I was taught to be here at this school and I cleaned it all up and I got my flashlight and my 10 power magnifying glass and the guy came across, he's like, good Lord, man, if you need the magnifying glass to see it, it's good enough. 
okay, that's not the right way to be. So that was not. I did not impress me. Uh, yeah. No. Um, plane bearings. I never reuse them. Once I take the engine apart, they just boom. They go in the trash. They are not that expensive, provided they're not out of an E-series engine and they're silver. If they're an E-series engine and it's silver and you're doing a prop strike, you got to, or I'm sorry, not a prop strike because they get damaged, but you're, you're just taking it apart for some reason. You got to think real hard. Do I want to, uh, they may, may be the ones you have to use. Uh, they're hard to find. But otherwise, common bearings like out of a 290 or, you know, any Lycoming or conventional Continental, they just hit the trash pile. Uh, I do want to know where they came out of, so I still mark them because you want to look and see what it's doing. They should have kind of a little hourglass shape in them. They shouldn't be all scored up. Make sure everything's running nice in them. Um, but anyway, they're too too cheap to put a whole engine back together and keep using them. So these two are our anti-friction. This is a what type? That's these are plain. What's this right here? This gold part. That's my thrust. What is this right here? This little bulge. That's my tang. Why is there a hole in it? No, nope. it's where the oil comes through. So if you actually, that there's a hole right in the middle for the dowel, that, that the hole to go right here. So you have to make sure that when you're putting these into the crankcase that the oil holes line up. You don't want to cover an oil hole. That would be, that would be very bad. All right, crankshafts. The crankshaft is like your kidneys. <laughs> I'm just making up medical stuff here. Crankshafts, all right. Conv converts, converts reciprocating, which means what? Reciprocating motion of the piston, of the piston, and connecting rod. which I will now forevermore call a con rod, so I have to write all that, to rotary motion. All right, they are forged out of extremely strong steel alloy. Alloy, 4330 to be exact. <coughs> 340, sorry, if you care. The actual process for making these crankshafts, to me, is fascinating. I wish I could see more of it done. Um, light combing is heated to uh, 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours, and then they, they bring it out of this furnace instantly, and they bring it down on some blocks, and they check runout. And runout is... Um, so if you have something and you're rotating it, you want to check run out. So you're going to put a, a, a let's say dial indicator. Um, <coughs> so I just lost my word. Not Yeah, dial indicator. That's what I said. That's yeah. dial, dial indicator on it. And with a little needle on it, you watch how out of round it is. So if it's kind of coming up like this, that's out of round, right? Yeah. But if it's spinning totally true, that's straight and round. So they actually do this 24 hours, and then they check run out. Bent crankshafts, if it's got any sort of bent, it's placed under hydraulic ram and pressed within the two minutes of the removal of the ovens. They just press it as much as they need to and then check the runouts. It's super hot. That's how they get it actually straight. Um, they start with these gigantic billets and, and, and uh, they were forged and mill it down to what they want. So I don't need you to know all that. I just thought it was really cool. Um, I'll put this down. This is important. They are nitrite hardened. Yes. Who would be dumb enough to do such a thing? I know, right? <laughs> a rookie mistake. <laughs> All right, so they're nitride hardened. Now, nitriding is something that you kind of need to know about. If you don't, then sometimes things don't make a lot of sense. So I'll let you write this. I'm going to move over. But so I've told you that light homing, I, I liked working with their crankshafts more because they come standard. Then, in the old days, you could polish it to three under which really means it kind of, if it ran nice and true into service limit, you just called it three under at a certain point, which means it was three, everything is three thousandths under. So 
And in your worksheet, your little thing, I ask you to figure out what is 3, uh, 6, and 10 under. And you just have to do some math. I want you to understand that. So you just take all of the numbers for standard and minus 3 thousandths from each of those. And that's what your numbers are. So it can go to serviceable and you're like, well, but that's now new 3 under. And you just get bearings that are a little bit fatter that take up that space. And so you could polish it to 3 under. Then you could send it out and have it ground another three after that wear, but they had to re-nitrite it. And then, uh, then you'd just get a little bit thicker bearings. It would say M06 on the back of the bearing. Uh, the other one said M03. Then after that, you could send it and get it ground 10 thousandths under from the original size, and you get even fatter bearings. It would say M010, M010. Uh, but you have to re-nitrite it. So you had to re-nitrite it after the 6 and the 10. Well, they've changed that. Now they want you to re-nitrite it at 3, 6, and 10 because the nitriting isn't thick enough. So, so what would happen is I would often get a crankshaft and I would do all my in-house NDT and then I would determine that it, I wanted it to go 6 under, but I have to send it out to have a ground and re-nitrite it because I couldn't do that. And I would get this phone call, hey, man, we lost it in nitriting. I'm like, we lost it in nitrate. I mean, did you look for it? I mean, is it like fall under the table or something in nitrate? <laughs> you know, and I never really stopped to ask him, you know, please explain the process. And so uh, eventually I got to know the process. I'm like, oh, I get it. Um, so what nitriting is, it's this ammonia baked process. So it's nitrogen from, I can't even, it's from ammonia gas is forced to penetrate the surface of the steel by exposing the part for 40 hours to a temperature of 975 degrees. So they take this crankshaft and they bake it at 975 degrees for two solid days. And what happens is it would like sag or crack because of the heat. And so it meant that it broke at that point. So nitriding, nitriding. So what happens with, the, so this ammonia gets into it and it's, it's, I guess, the nitrogen or something in it. That's why they call it, yeah, it is nitrogen. So that's why they call it nitriding. It bakes into the surface, and it makes the surface extremely hard. But it only goes into a depth of a maximum of about uh, zero, 010. Zero. So, why would some of them bend their I think there was an impurity on the inside that came out of it or something, like an inclusion with an air pocket or something that might have burst so or something. Something just from the yeah, yeah. Was that hard to explain to a customer? Like, you're doing this work and then all of a sudden they have to buy a new crankshaft? Um, no, I don't know. I guess I never had that problem. It didn't happen very often. Oh. Yeah, it was a pretty rare, rare occurrence. Yeah, I was trying to think. Yeah, it seemed to go fine. It was never a happy call, but <laughs> I didn't say, hey, we lost your thing in nitriding. Well, did they look harder? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so nitriding, nit oops, I wanted to write nitrogen there. So, because I already wrote the other word. Um, nitrogen, N-I-T-R-O-G, nitrogen from an H-Y-D-R-O-U-S ammonia Ammonia gas. I don't know. I just said ammonia gas because I don't want to try and pronounce that word. A n a n h y d r o u s. Alan, what is that word? Anhydrous. Anhydrous. Ammonia gas is forced is forced to penetrate penetrate the surface. Um, of penetrate. Surface of the surface of steel by exposing the part. Uh, oops, for about for about forty hours. at 975 degrees F. That is hot. Then, this became a significant aha moment for me. Anything that is not to be um, nitrided, nitrided, is coated 
with copper. Did anybody just have an aha moment with me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what do you have in your pile of stuff that is coated with copper? Bolt. I can think of two things. Cam shaft. The camshaft. Mm. Except there's certain parts that are not, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what does that tell you? All of the lobes and the bearing surfaces are nitrided, but everything in the middle is not. Why do you suppose they would do that? Okay, it doesn't all need to be hardened. That is true. Why did they elect to spend the money? I always think about labor, copper, uh, process. Why would they spend the time, energy, materials and to put copper on it when they could have just put it in the oven and said, just can I try the whole thing? So this is ammonia gas. I don't care. Okay, so there we go. Nitriding causes it to become very, very hard. If something is very, very hard, it's prone to Brittles. cracking. It becomes more brittle. All right, so now this is just me thinking here, but you want a little bit of flex in that camshaft. So if you get some flex between the lobes, it's not going to crack. So why do we, but why do we nitride the lobes and the bearings? It's a lot of pressure on those. It's metal on metal. It's got a ramp. It's got to push everything. There's a there's a tremendous amount of pressure on there. So you want it hardened. Okay, I can think of one other thing. Let's see if you can think of it in your engine that's copper coated. Would it be the uh, connecting rod where the piston pin goes through? Ooh, that was a good call. No, nope, that's just the color of them. It's not nitrided. They want those actually pretty soft. Oh, I, I was just going for copper. Oh, no, no. Green? Nope. Although, you are right. There's no copper on it, but the rings are nitrided in many cases. Oh, no. Oh. Rocker arms. Oh, now your rocker arms are all coated except for the foot. The foot and the ball, the ball socket in the back. They are not. I noticed that. Yeah, it's a little bit of copper. So, tells me yeah, yeah, the foot was nitrided. So, there we go. Um, Okay, some areas, some areas, not nitrided, are uh, prop flange, prop flange, that's Lycoming only. Uh, Continental, they nitride their entire crankshaft. So that means that Lycomings, they bend up front. Continental, they just crack. Um, Prop flange, like the hanger, oh, the hanger blades. Hanger blades. Where the um, counterweights go, we'll talk about those. Um, and gear pad, and gear pad. So I've been told, I don't know. Which one did you say was completely nitrated? Continental. So is there more main bearings? That, uh, like no, the very, the very front, oh. the very, the prop flange, so, let me see. So right here, this is a Continental. Uh, sorry, this is a Lycoming. Let's try it again. This is a Lycoming, and this area right here, yeah. I don't know, probably from about this, this, this is the slinger ring. This slinger ring forward, I don't think they nitride this up here. Mm -hmm. And because I would get a lot of prop strikes where the run out on this would be pretty significant. Now, it used to be that you could go 0 0.018 thousandths, of, if I get my numbers in my head, remember right, of an inch run out. And you could send it out and they could grind it straight again. But if it was anything over that, you had to reject the crankshaft, which was an interesting thing. And this is, well, I guess I'm doing it more, so I'll just tell you. So this is how I could easily sell engines because thankfully somebody did me a favor one day. They brought in a crankshaft. Uh, I don't know if there was a prop strike they had, they bought it out at Kenny Face or whatever, they brought it in, said, hey, we want you to yellow tag this crankshaft because we're building an engine, and said, okay. So I brought it in the back, first thing I did, throw it in the V-blocks, do a run out, and said, no, I'm sorry, this thing's got, you know, uh, uh, 20 thousandths run out. It's too much, or whatever it was. It was way more than the 18 allowed, and I said, it's got, it's a red tag. Oh, okay, well, we don't need the red tag or anything, we'll just take our crankshaft. So they, you know, paid their inspection fee and took the crankshaft and left. And then they came back after lunch with a different new crankshaft. And how about now? How does this one? And I put on the V-blocks. I'm like, hey, the runout's only about 10,000. Yeah, this can be fixed. Did you get a new one? Nope. 
we got a sledgehammer and a stump. <laughs> and they beat it straight and then brought it in. So now that crankshaft then, you know, I did my work. And so then it gets sent out to somebody else who do the grinding and re-nitriding and all that other stuff. You know, I, I just did a Magnaflux on it to do the initial, <laughs> make sure it wasn't cracked. So I tell you that story to tell people when they would come in my shop, you know, they, I would tear down their engine or they'd say, why would I pay you the money to overhaul my engine when I could just call Lycoming and get a factory overhaul? I said, let me tell you about factory overhaul. Do you, do you trust your engine? Like, I trust my engine. Do you know the history? Yes, never had a problem. Well, that's probably the engine I'd want to keep. Let me tell you this story. And I would tell them that story and say, now, somewhere in Lycoming, that crankshaft is probably sitting in a pile getting ready to put an engine. Do you want that engine? They're like, no way, man. Like, I don't know if that's true, but it's how I sold the engine. <laughs> so then I'd over it. And always help to say, plus, I'm right here, and you know if I screw up, you can bring your put your hands around my little neck and choke me to death. So. All right. Um, beat it with a sledgehammer. But they have changed that service bolt, probably because of those two guys. Uh, now, now they just say depth. No. Uh, let's see. Oh, so let me see. One, two, three, four. So um, the, the depth, depth of nitriding is about 0 0.010 max. One other thing that is nitrided, cylinder barrels. So we'll talk about an upper end, but cylinder barrels come in, yeah, you can lump into three, three groups, nitrided, plain steel, and plated. And there's a lot of different plating. And sometimes the rings were nitrided. All right, so more about crankshafts. So opposed, opposed, inline, um, V engines, all those type of engines like the v V12 Allisons, they're all single piece. Which means, oops, that's one piece through and through. This is a continental. One piece, there's nowhere to take it apart. However, the radials, the radial engines can be two or more pieces tow. Jeez. Let's try spelling. Two or more pieces. Uh, which makes them kind of fun to put together. Let's see, where are we here? We got crankshaft. Should we talk about sludge tubes? Oh, yeah. I have a treat for you. Okay, so the newer crankshafts, all the new ones, like this is a new one, and I can tell just by looking at it. The new ones have little tiny tubes, like a straw, and that straw is going to come from here, and it's going to aim up and go right to this hole. It's going to come right through here and go to that hole. And this one is going to come up and go to that hole. And there's one over here that's going to come up and go to that hole. And this one's going to go into that. So what happens is you have the oil pressure is coming through. Can I do a different color for oil pressure maybe? Uh, we go blue. So oil pressure is coming from the crankcase through that little hole in the bearing into here. And the oil pressure travels through this tube and out here and lubricates this and then just drips off. Drip. Drip. All right, and so this is the center main. So oil, I'm getting very good at this, huh? So oil pressure comes through here. It goes out to this and lubricates all of that. This comes through here and lubricates that. All right, that's the new style of crankshafts. And if you were to try and knock out this hollow tube, you can go ahead and do that, but you ruin the crankshaft. You're not supposed to take those out. You have sludge tubes in your engines because they are old. And what that is, is this little hole is just a hole and it goes to the back side of so it's just like this of course there's some thickness to it and there's just a hole drilled right through mm -hmm. so now we'll switch colors so the oil um, from right here how's it go the transfers still down into here but yeah. um, Blue. 
So we have another hole and the oil comes from the same thing through here. There is a passageway and it comes through there and it goes here and it fills this up and then it goes this way and, and around here. Uh, hopefully that made sense with my stupid drawing. Okay. But if you take out the sludge tubes, if you take out the sludge tube, that worked, take out the sludge tubes, then it's just a hollow tube and it just falls out. So the oil just, there we go, pin because I can, the oil just runs out of here. So are they just like freeze plugs then? No, here they are. Let's go to the picture. Go to picture. These are the sludge tubes. They are just, you throw them out. You take them out, you knock them out, and you throw them away because they're, they're a press fit inside. So you're not supposed to reuse them. So I took apart a crankshaft the other day, and I'm just gonna let, I'm gonna pass this around. I, I saved it. This is the sludge. And you see it's all packed around in there. And I told you that if you put like you, if you put your crankshaft in a blast booth and you got some of that bead inside those little oil holes, well, this is just, this is right what's on the other side of that oil hole. So the oil comes in, goes around this, and then out in another spot. So it's always circulating around there. But the sludge collects in there. And this is sludge. Sludge is wonderful stuff. Uh, you can touch it. It's nasty. It's lead. Uh, it's It's not good for you. Um, if you if you touch if it's wet and you touch it it's like um this I, I touched it. It's like, I touched it. <laughs> can you see like you lift the little impression rings down here it's nasty and it doesn't come off your fingers. It just keeps on smear. It's like, I don't know if you guys like don't read. Keys. I know. If you ever read Cat in the Hat with the ring around the bathtub and it just keeps going and going, it's what sludge is like. Now, this sludge has another problem since we're talking about this. Um, this sludge also collects in the front of the crankshaft, this hollow tube up here. All inside of here. This is hollow. And so sludge starts collecting in there. Well, in uh, an engine with a fixed pitch propeller, such as the engine you're working on, uh, the front, you can see that there's no way for this. I don't have a picture of the front of the crankshaft, I don't think. Let me see. Well, okay, here we go. So this one is open. Yeah. All right, yours is closed up. It's, just, it's a freeze plug. It's literally what they are. And it's hammered into place. Crazy as that may sound, it's not safety to just beat into place and you hope it stays. So in a fixed pitch propeller, no oil comes out of this hole. In a constant speed propeller, this is the oil comes out of here that drives the pitch of the propeller. And so if you have a fixed pitch propeller, what happens is the oil goes in there and the sludge separates from the oil that builds up against the wall, but it also contains moisture. And so that moisture collects between the sludge and the crankshaft steel. What is that gonna do? Rust, so there become, there's an error with this directive because this rust has propagated to the point where the front of the crankshaft would come off in flight. Oh. So that's, that's, a, that's a bad thing to happen. Yeah. And so there's an error with this directive where you actually have to go inside um, on certain, uh, on the light combings and you have to get the sludge out and uh, inspect it and it's a whole thing. Um, how did this joke go? I didn't realize it was a joke, but it became really f kind of funny once I realized it. Oh yeah, so uh, you kind of guess you gotta have to have anybody here in the medical industry ever, except for Katie. So you have to if you put so you you uh, this air within this directive tells you you have to go in there, get all the sludge out, you have to clean it, and you have to inspect it, and then you have to coat it with this stuff, and when you coat it with the stuff, you stamp PID on it, and that's PID is. Um, Medical term is shorthand for pelvic inflammatory disease. Right? I don't even know what that is, but it's, I don't think it's a good thing. It's like a venereal disease, huh? Or something. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> it's okay, so that's a bad thing. It's, um, but, and so you're not going to appreciate the joke. And the, but the stuff that you coat it with is called urethra bond. <laughs> so I don't know if they're making these jokes, these pelvic jokes, and urethras. And, but anyway, so you coat it with this urethra bond and stamp it with PID on the outside. And anyway. But I was talking about crankshafts. There I go. So there's our sludge tubes. All right, so back to, this is a radial engine. And the, the rule of thumb here is, 
It's a really good rule of thumb. If you have a single piece, single piece master rod, this is the master rod. Can you guys all see that? I don't know if I have a better picture. If you have a single piece master rod, you must have at least a two piece crankshaft or you can't get this onto that, right? Something's gotta come apart. Think about how your connecting rod looks. Your connecting rod splits in half, right? Well, not half, but you know, the big end. We call that the big end, by the way. There's the big end and the small end. That's really what we call them, the big end. So the big end splits in half, and it goes around the crankshaft. Well, if it didn't do that, the crankshaft would have to come apart, right? Okay, well, that's how radials work. If you have a single-piece master rod, this is a master rod, you must have a two-piece crankshaft because this has to go on that. But notice how this really isn't keyed to that. So it becomes a lot of fun to actually put those together. The counterweights have to match up and be perfectly balanced in line, although not balanced, it has to be perfectly in line, otherwise it, uh, it wobbles. So you have to set all that up and that takes a very long time. Does it have like a spline or anything? Mm -mm. You know what it has? See this right here? Can you see that? It's a keyway. And so you get a half inch square key and you pound it in. It's, there's one on the other side, you pound that in and it kind of lines it up but then you, you bolt it together and you torque it and you put it in uh, blocks and you have to do a run out on it. And then if it's not perfect, then you rue the clamp and you move them a little bit one way or another because you can get uh, a couple thousands of play even out of that. So you just, you, know, you just sit there and you spend an hour or two or three or whatever it takes until it's perfect and lock it in and you're done. You just can't be in a hurry. So you said if it's a single, uh, single piece. If this is single piece, you so got to have at least a two-piece crank, or how are you going to get this onto this? So is there a single, or so is there a two-piece main connecting rod? Yep, absolutely. Let me see. All right, well, this is just kind of the same. It's just a drawing, but you got to put the master rod on here, which is also a great point about a good Q&A question. What kind of bearings does a radial engine have? Ball bearings or yeah, ball or roller. What kind of bearing does the master rod have? Plane bearing. Why do you suppose that is? I have my theory, and my theory is that okay, this master and articulating rod assembly is off center, so you have to have balance weights down here so it all balances out. But if I add a whole bunch of mass up here with this giant bearing. What do I have to do to the other side of the crankshaft? I got to have more weight, so the whole thing just gets heavier and heavier. So I think that's why they use the plane bearing. So this is just a picture of a power case coming together, and you can see all that. I don't know if there's any. All right, so we got all that. All right, so back to my notes. All right, so radio can be two or more pieces. So it's almost time to go. Um, let's see. They are hollow, most of most. Not just radial, but all of them. H O L. Hollow with an A is a different type of meaning. Hollow. Uh, why would I make them hollow? Weight. Yep. Reduces weight. Reduces weight. It provides oil passages. I had one student who actually lost the front of his crankshaft uh, on a flight. I would, I would tell you that story if you wanted. Um, he told it. It was fascinating. So did the whole like, propeller come off? He was flying up in the mountains oh. um, with a full load of people on this plane. Oh. Um, <laughs> and he started getting oil all over the windshield. Oh, wow. And it started getting worse and worse. And then his propeller, because his constant speed, he started losing. The RPM starts fluctuating. I think he started losing oil pressure. Um, because when you start losing oil to the pr propeller, it's going to start doing funny things. Um, so he starts losing this, and he starts, he's realized this engine's about to quit. And he starts looking around, he sees a little path that he can make it in. And he can, he can barely see out the front window. And then the engine quit. He's coming in, I guess, and the engine, it dies. It quits on him. And so he's got this glide path in. He has no forward visibility whatsoever. Just by memory, he, me he knew this is where I got to go. And at the side window, he could see the trees coming and he's like and he made it down through the trees so he's like okay i know i'm in that clearing so he lands in the clearing you know and, and he, they get out he landed safely he's a great pilot and he's just he said i'm just so visibly shaken you know i just you know 
poo and everything. And, <laughs> and he's just, you know, standing there just, you know, I, I imagine you trying not to vomit and everything. And his buddy goes, what happened to your prop? It's not even there. There was no propeller anywhere, and they never found it. Wow. And so he went back to the guy he had bought the airplane from, and and uh, apparently it had a prop strike, and they didn't disclose it, and they didn't do an inspection. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, uh, let's see. Where Provide sludge tube chambers, if you still have it. And then we covered sludge. Um, what is sludge? Sludge. Sludge is mostly nasty, mostly <laughs> lead from combustion. From combustion. And it's, uh, it's slung to the outside by centrifugal force in there. And I suppose we should probably hold it there rather than rushing through this. Um, yeah, you can edit there. 